And um, I'd like for them just to run through and introduce themselves quickly, and then we can get started. Okay. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Ben Edwards. I'm a 2013 St. Clair grad for all the saints in the house. Um, and I went to uh, the University of Toledo. Uh, hello, I am Leonard Glodich. I'm a 2012 graduate of uh, Main City High School and a 2016 graduate from uh, Adrian College. Hi, I'm Colette Birch. I'm a 2013 grad from Waterford Kettering High School and a 2017 grad from the University of Michigan. I'm Megan Salisbury. I graduated in 08 from Marine City High School, um, and then I graduated in 2012 from Lawrence Tech, and then I did my master's at Wayne State. Hi, everyone. I'm John McCormick. I graduated from Northville High School in 2011 and University of Michigan in 2016. Hi, I am not Tom Lewis, this person right here who's on the uh, phone. And he graduated in 2003 from Marine City High School and then U of M Dearborn four years later. And he's lived all over the world and works for Bosch. Okay. I'm loud, so I'm not gonna use that. But I just wanted to say, uh, my name is Kim Schonk and I'm the moderator for this evening. If you have questions as you're listening, please feel free to raise your hand, okay? There's a lot of people. We have two hours of conversation with these folks. We will open it up for questions and answers after they go through their story. So if you have something to write with and you find uh, you know, yourself wanting to ask a specific question and you don't want to do it until Q&A, that would be fine. Write it down and we'll make sure we hit it. Okay? Um, so as a matter of starting, I just wanted to say that in oh, 2000, the year 2000, if you wanted to go on vacation, what did you do? I, I suppose I'm mostly speaking to the parents in the audience right now. But. You spent a lot of time trying to decide. Maybe you did a little research. Maybe you called a travel agent. You spent some time, effort, and energy. And today, what do you do? You go on Hopper to get your plane tickets. You can go on Haymaker Schlemmer and buy a plane, actually a hovercraft, but it's only 190000 done. Uh, it's a flying hovercraft, so that's a good deal. Um, you use Yelp to find reservations. You use hotels to hotels.com to um, book your hotel, and you have a vacation, a whole vacation. How much time do we spend doing that? So technology has really advanced us. Now that's just one aspect of technology. That's just the computer industry. By the way, computer industry in technology is responsible for about 44% of the jobs, okay? So that high-tech uh, work in engineering and computer engineering is about 44% of the jobs all over the country, okay? Women in engineering, I'm really, really glad to see a, a bunch of girls here. That's awesome. Women in engineering right now, about 14%, but definitely on the rise. Okay? And you can see the average numbers here. In engineering, there's a lot of opportunity. There are a lot of jobs. Responsible engineering right now, in 2015, there was nearly 8.6 million STEM jobs in May of 2015. That's on the rise. The majority of those jobs are in engineering, okay? So you're in the right place, all right? And your heads are in the right place. What's important in high school? What's important if you want to go into engineering in high school? Well, that's what these guys are going to talk about. What's important there, the decisions that they made, and how they got to where they are now, okay? And some of them are on the path to maybe changing that a little bit. So. It's not to say that when you're in high school and you think you want to be an engineer, that that's it. That's the end all to the, your career path. No. Most people change careers through the course of their employment. Okay? And you may do the same. So you want to make sure that more than anything, this is what I do with kids, you build a foundation. And if you're here and you're solid in math science, you have a great foundation. Okay? So we're going to start with Ben. All right, so um, Ben. St. Clair, what year? Uh, I graduated in 2013. Okay, so when you were a junior in high school, what were you thinking? Uh, in general? Well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Let's say, what were you thinking um, about careers? What, what was in your head? Uh, I kind of knew I wanted to go into some type of engineering, and um, I liked um, building things, so I knew I wanted to go kind of construction or civil. Um, but I really didn't know anything about it, and I didn't know anybody that did it. So 
I was kind of in limbo, you know. I knew I wanted to kind of explore that path, but at the same time, I didn't know how. Okay. Um, you said perhaps civil, that that was one of the considerations. And what made you decide? You're, you're what are you? Construction. There you go. Yes. Construction engineering. Okay. And where did that come from? Um, I decided to go to the University of Toledo after I applied to a bunch of the different colleges. Toledo offers a civil engineering program and a construction engineering program. And the construction program is a lot more hands-on and you get more um, in-depth you know, field experience through your classes. There's a lot of hands-on labs. Um, and so that kind of appealed to me instead of sitting in a classroom doing a bunch of math, um, trying to figure out how much a beam is gonna weigh. You know, that okay. was a lot, a lot more appealing. You decided to go to University of Toledo. Did you apply to other schools? Uh, yes, I applied to probably about 10 schools. Um, my mom said I needed to apply to multiple, so I kind of took that. And she's like, I'll, I'll pay for all of the application fees. So I'm like, all right, sounds good. Let's see where I can get in. Um, so I applied to 10. I went and visited probably about six. Um, and I really thought I was going to go to Michigan State after seeing the campus and you know I really liked the layout in the city um, but then Toledo was the last one I went and visited um, and I just fell in love with the campus fell in love with the people um, and found the program that I wanted to go into so it was kind of like a perfect fit very cool I wanted to mention he said they fell in love with the campus that's the number one indicator that people will not be back there next year is that they don't it's not a good fit okay they're not comfortable at the university that they end up at and a lot of times people take it based on the name but what Ben's describing is a situation where he felt comfortable ladies and gentlemen you're gonna be living there living there for four years if you can while you're doing the tour and I strongly suggest that you everyone does the tour okay at least once I, I three times would be ideal um, the campus that you think is the one that you want, okay? You should probably visit three times. Not the Saturday night with the friends kind of visit. The legit tour, okay? But I'm going to suggest something. When you're with a group, and it's usually about 20 people, when you're with that group, hang back a little bit. After you leave the dorm, hang back. Hang back by yourself. Not with mom, not with dad. By yourself. And look around and think, can I live here? Is this comfortable? Okay. Is that 11 by 14 square brick thing something that I can live in? At least for a year. Then you find a place off campus. But you need to think about those things. You need to feel comfortable. It's got to be a good match. Okay? Good. Uh, so the position that you're in now, what does it look like? I am a project engineer for a bridge contractor um, out of Wild Lake, Michigan. Um, and we're the big, it's a company called CA Hall. We're the biggest bridge contractor in Michigan, so we do all of the highway bridges and county bridges pretty much in the whole state. Um, so my job looks like, um, you know, I could be on a project up in Sault Ste. Marie one day, and then next week I'm down in Detroit on a project. So I'm all over the state um, managing construction projects, um, mostly bridge work. Cool. How, how do you use math? Like, how does math show up in your job? Uh, my job is to do math. So, yeah, um, I do a lot of um, plan reading, so that's construction, so working off blueprints. Um, I'm calculating out, you know, measurements and um, quantities, um, different things like that. And my job is basically to make sure that we build the project under budget and we get paid by the state what we're supposed to get paid. So numbers are my life. Yeah. So I asked them, I asked some of the panelists to provide some examples of math in their workplace. And if they're not in the bio, they will be available on Reese's website. So you can kind of take a look at that, what they're up against on a daily basis. And uh, some of them will talk about how they use math in their uh, workplace as opposed to showing you some examples. And, but we will have those available for you to see, okay? Cool. What else do you want to tell us? What do you think is the greatest thing about your job? Uh, the greatest thing about my job is I never do the same thing two days in a row. So I'm always doing something different every single day, and I'm constantly learning. I think that's the biggest thing for me is I love my job because I'm constantly doing something new, and I'm constantly learning something new. So when you go home, do you shut it off, or are you still thinking about work? Constantly thinking about work. Because yeah. my job is to figure out how to do something better how to build a bridge better. So I'm constantly trying to figure out 
you know, how can I do, you know, make this process better so my company makes more money. Wow, that's nice of you. Yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of uh, doing something better, um, you are considering a, a different kind of job or an extension, or how do you see what you're headed for next academically? Uh, so I, I just graduated last May from the University of Toledo. And uh, currently, I'm taking MBA classes through Toledo Online um, because I like the business side of construction. So I would like to further my career um, towards the business kind of administration side of it. That's cool. I, I know my brother. My brother is a builder, and he said that he said I can't have sheetrock up a ladder for the rest of my life. You know, and you need to uh, you know have a foundation to build on and. So, yeah, that's what he did. It, the same kind of situation was went into the business side. So, and that's another point that I was trying to make earlier is that you need to build a foundation and one that will grow with you. So, in the event that you decide to change, whether it's a total change or whether it's um, an extension of what it is that you already do, it's important to have that foundation so you don't waste two things, time or money, okay? So, that's efficient. I wouldn't expect an engineer to do this, right? All right. Yes. Hello, everybody. Okay. What was important when you were in high school? Uh, <laughs> so, a lot of things that Ben said um, were not exactly true for me. Um, to be honest, in high school, sports was probably number one importance for me, which is a good story for me just because it gives people, um, this is a different side of what you have interest in, and I don't want to say sports as only sports, but extracurricular activities were probably my greatest interest in high school. I was a good student, but sports and extracurricular activities were my definite um, highest desire going through high school. He said good student, he was a great student, and he knew that academically he could probably go wherever he darn well pleased, but what was important was um, to make that match work with his athletics as well as academics. Yep, so um, my senior year, uh, coming into my senior year, had no idea where I wanted to go. Um, I had played baseball throughout my whole career and it was a true desire to play collegiate baseball somewhere. Um, I, this is as Ms. Shunk said, um, I, was, I was a good student and um, I knew I could get into a lot of schools, maybe not uh, University of Michigan, but I could certainly to go to multiple multiple schools um, based on where I applied, but my true desire was to play collegiate baseball. Um, so uh, about halfway through my senior year, um, I took a visit to Adrian College, which is about 45 minutes south of uh, Ann Arbor. Small school, about a little under 2,000 students. Um, a Division three school, for anyone that knows how the NCAA works, you have your Division I schools, which is uh, Michigan, Michigan State, uh, Western, Central. You have your Division II schools, so Northwood, uh, Grand Valley, um, Wayne State, and then you have your Division III schools, which um, are the private schools that are less enrollment, but smaller class sizes, uh, potentially um, um, higher tuition, but often, give better academic scholarships than maybe a larger school would give. So um, I was very fortunate enough to receive an academic scholarship to Adrian. A lot of people I think, um, I say I played collegiate baseball and they think I got an athletic scholarship, uh, but the truth is I had a full tuition academic scholarship to go to, to Adrian um, because my, my GPA and my ACT combined uh, to be good enough. Um, so I was very lucky for that and uh, that after my visit there, more than once, as Mr. Shunk was talking about, um, I met with the baseball coach. He enjoyed all the abilities that I had to offer. Um, I went on multiple visits and enjoyed the campus. I enjoyed the, fa the small uh, campus feel. Um, like I said, it was a small school, so um, I felt very home because I uh, graduated from Marine City, which is, a, I would consider a small school. Um, five, 600 kids go there. Um, and felt very at home there, as Mrs. Junk was talking about earlier. Is uh, I felt very um, at home, very comfortable there. I didn't feel overwhelmed. Um, I have a twin sister, actually. She went to Michigan State as a freshman, as I went to Adrian and Michigan State. 
I'm not sure how many people go to Michigan State. Mm, 50,000? 42,000 people. So I went there my freshman year, and the literally the feeling that I got, and this is not for everybody, but this is just for myself, um, I felt overwhelmed being around 42,000 people. When I was at Adrian, 1,500, 2,000 people, I felt much better going to Adrian. So that was a personal choice. Um, and like I said earlier, I was a, a good student, so I was able to get a lot of academic scholarship by um, applying to the right scholarships and by um, making sure I uh, understood where I could earn as much money as I possibly could to go to a private school like Adrian. You have a degree in physics. Yes. I knew I wanted to do something in math and science related, but um, as I spoke previously, I wanted to play baseball as well. So um, based on support through my parents and support through coaches and stuff, they said, you go do your, your desire, you go play your collegiate baseball, and the rest will work itself out later. So um, Adrian College does not have an engineering department or engineering field um, that they have. So uh, what I chose to do was be a physics major there. Um, not necessarily because I was a physics guru or anything, or um, just loved everything about physics, but that was um, a science field that I felt comfortable in. I took multiple physics classes in high school, enjoyed it, nothing too crazy, um, and thought, okay, this is a field that I could pursue. Maybe not something I could do for the rest of my life, but this is a degree that I could pursue. Um, it was challenging. I would be lying if I said it wasn't challenging, but getting through my physics and mathematics minors, what it turned into being, um, is something I'm very proud of. Playing collegiate baseball is something I'm very proud of because that allowed me to meet certain people um, outside of the physics world at Adrian, right? Um, I met a lot of business majors, a lot of sports management majors that were completely um, different, had mindsets, different um, people skills, different just general interest than I had in the physics world, which was good because that allowed me to know more people, market myself better for whatever life threw at me in the future. Um, and what a lot of people don't understand is if um, you want to say you want to have an engineering job, right? You don't necessarily need, I say this because I plan to get an engineering master's degree, but you don't need an engineering bachelor's to have per se an engineering job. If you are in the science or mathematics area, that is often enough of an education to at least get your foot in the door, right? To um, have a basic job and have a, um, get your foot in the door and build your way up from there. Um, one of my personal opinions is the reason that I'm um, at the position that I am today, which is a product engineer, um, is because I had the physics background compared to everyone else that interviewed for the job that had mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, because my mindset as a physics major was able to think differently uh, than the rest of the engineering uh, background. And I had a different background with my extracurricular activities um, than a lot of other people had uh, competing for the same job or position. How did you end up at, I'm going to say, TRW? Yep. So it is... It, it used to be known as TRW Automotive. Um, it has recently been bought out by a company called ZF Group, um, German company. Um, there's a ZF plant in Marysville here, um, but that is a, a different, different plant than what I work at. Um, but to be honest, uh, I was a senior in, high, or senior in college, I'm sorry, and I had a couple internships, but didn't truly know where I wanted to, to go in life, or you know, I still didn't have that true idea, right? And I literally uh, made a phone call to uh, some buddies um, from high school. Um, and his name is Doug Kelly. He was a year older than me, um, and who was currently working at, I'm just, I'll call, him, uh, call it ZF, um, and just had a discussion with him, right? Hey, how you doing? How's things? He was already there for about two years. He was a co-op, and now he had a full-time position. And I, just, I was picking his brain. I'm thinking about getting my master's in engineering degree. Um, what do you think the best engineering degree to get my master's in, not thinking that I was going to have a job pretty soon. And I'm just talking to him, 
And he's like, you know what? Just apply for this uh, product engineer position that I have. He goes, I work with people. I know how smart you are. I know your people skills. And I think you, you'd be good for the job. So I said, OK, I'm, no issues with that. Applied. And literally a week later, I was coming in for my first interview. And then the next week, I came in for my second interview. And just like that, um, I was thinking I was going to go to master to somewhere to get my master's degree in an engineering degree. Um, and two weeks later, I have a full-time position um, that I'm lucky enough that they will be able to pay for my master's um, after working there for a year. So um, it's very, it was very unorthodox route, but I'm very thankful for how everything worked out. And um, one of the main things I agreed to participate with this is that um, I know from my personal experience, and I want everyone to know that you don't need to know what you're doing coming out of high school. You don't need to know what you're doing, you know, in your first or second year of college. I was in my seventh semester in college, and I s did not know what I was going to do for a career. And it's just funny how things work out in life. If you keep good contact with a lot of people, if you are, are nice to people and don't burn bridges, that's also very nice for when you're looking for a job. Um, but if you have confidence in yourself and you allow yourself to uh, have or do what you desire in life, as I went to Adrian and wanted to play college baseball, um, it, get, it allows you to take your own route in life that um, will pay off. So that's one of the main reasons I wanted to speak to everyone today is that you don't need to have a plan from tonight moving forward. It's OK. It, being in college allows you to understand a lot of different fields and different avenues you can take. but. Um, I would strongly urge people to do what they want to do in life and not what they feel like they have to do. Yeah. That's awesome. I want to say I work with approximately uh, three to 500 students every year in high school who are considering on the cusp of making decisions about their future. And I'm so much more comfortable with someone who says, I don't really know what I want to do, than with someone who says, this is what I'm doing. Because that person probably will not be doing that. You know. Um, that's a rare occasion that somebody leaves high school, goes through that career, or goes to that um, uh, academic situation, and then into that career and stays there for life. Okay? Uh, one of the biggest reasons for that is this. How much do you know about what kind of jobs exist? I heard a kid say the other day in a conversation in class, he said, well, I was thinking about being a a product engineer, but I, you know, I don't, I don't really know anybody that does that. So then I thought it'd be easier just to be a mechanical engineer because I know that, you know. But he doesn't know that field. And so one of the things that Gunnar brought up and that Ben alluded to too is networking. The relationships that you make are critical, and they are helpful in in uh, making those connections that will do some work for you in the future. Okay? Yeah. Don't burn bridges. That's a good one. <laughs> nice. Colette. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. So, wait, wait, wait. Let me let me try this. Okay. So, Kettering, bigger high school. Yes. How many kids? Uh, I think my graduating class was 400. 400. That's about what's in our building in Marine City. So, um, that's interesting. Okay. So, Colette, how much career education did you have in high school? I did not have any career education in high school. I mean, I know I loved chemistry. I loved math. I loved physics. But I didn't know what I wanted to do at all um, for a career-wise because we didn't have anything like this where we got to actually talk to people going through that. So I had to base a lot of my choices on talking to friends who were older than me, talking to my parents, talking to my teachers. But yeah, I think this event is really cool for you guys to all actually get some face time with people who have done a similar path that you're interested in. So how did you decide to go where you went? So I, I graduated from the University of Michigan, and I, I love the big school atmosphere, but a big part of my decision was um, dance team. So I auditioned for the University of Michigan dance team after I applied, and I made the team, which is awesome because that's a varsity sport there. And so that was, I applied to a few different schools, and then making that and being able to do that extracurricular while getting my degree was the biggest factor in my choice. So that was easy, right? Dance team, engineering, it was easy. It was not easy, but it was a lot of fun. It was very rewarding. Got to go to all the home football, basketball games. Got to travel to a few of the big games, some bowl games, some tournaments. 
Um, and all the while meeting so many people from different backgrounds, so dance majors, business majors, doctors, all types of people. And that, in addition to my engineering classes, it was a, it was a tough load, but I learned a lot. I gained a lot of skills, both networking, people skills, time management, and I think it really shaped my college experience. You decided on engineering. I did. Um, I loved math and science in high school. I didn't really quite know what I wanted to do. I, um, I work for General Motors now, but in high school I didn't think I wanted to work for an auto company because my dad was an auto engineer. Um, but I love it, and like I said, math and science can get you anywhere, even if it isn't uh, an engineering degree. I completely agree with that. Um, but it opens a lot of doors for you. And I actually I started off as a biomedical engineer. Um, I switched to material science because that was more chemistry focused. It's kind of like an applied chemistry degree with a lot of problem solving. Um, you learn how, how the properties of a material plus manufacturing plus the design all together can make different products. So I love that. I love my degree. I loved having a small major. It's not one of the big ones. Mechanical engineering, there's several hundred students in a class. And material science, I think there were 60 in my graduating class at U of M. Uh, General Motors, you're working in a program where you're on rotation. Tell us about that. Explain how that works. Right. So any new hire to General Motors, um, if you have less than three years of career experience, is put into their track rotational program. So for two years, I'll be rotating between two and three positions. My first position right now, I just started in July. I am a quality engineer in side closures, which are the doors, if you didn't know, because I didn't know what that was before I started. Um, <laughs> So what I do as a quality engineer, I look at our warranty data. And I am on the crossover program. So that's your Traverse, your Enclave, Acadia, um, stuff like that. So I don't actually own any parts. I work on the whole program for the side doors. And I look at our warranty data. I work on our launch vehicles. So any problems that are coming up in launch, I'm going out and root causing vehicles. So it's very hands-on. When we get parts back in warranty, I work with the suppliers and the plant to figure out what is going on with these parts. Is it a plant build issue? Is it a supplier quality issue? Is it a design issue? And so we look at these parts that come back and we root cause them and we figure out why did it fail in the field. And then whose job is it to take it from there back to the fix? <coughs> so that's my job. I work with a lot of different types of engineers. So like I said, I'm on the program. And then you have your engineers for every part of the door you can think of. So I have to talk to all of them. I have to talk to the different plants. I have to talk to the system leads, managers, all different types of people. So it's a lot of networking every day. It's a lot of learning every day. So after you're done with, you have a three position rotation? Mm -hmm. OK. Yes. So when you're done with that, do you kind of say, I want this one? Yep. OK. And it doesn't, you can rotate wherever you want in General Motors. And it's crazy because. In high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I would agree in college, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do till pretty late on. And even in General Motors, it's crazy how many different opportunities there are. Even in like a product engineering role, there's so many different things you can do. So the possibilities really are endless. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Megan, when you were in high school, she was the mathiest kid. It's no science. I'm going to say science. Yeah? Both, yeah. yeah. It's just really logical. Um, so what made you decide to do what you were going to do, to go where you were going to go? Uh, well, up until the very end of my junior year, I thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Oh. Um, and I was really struggling with making the final decision on that because I knew that that would mean that I couldn't really have the family life that I wanted to have. Um, surgeons are gone all the time, they're on call all the time, and as much as I think still that I would have liked that job, I think I would have hated what it took me away from, <coughs> excuse me, in the rest of my life. Um, and I was talking to actually a different teacher at Marine City High School one day, um, and she said, why don't you look at biomedical engineering? She's like, you can do a lot of the same things and still have the lifestyle that you want. Um, so I started looking into that and um, decided that that was probably going to be the best fit I could possibly find for myself. Um, I'd, I was always that kid who liked to take stuff apart and put it back together. And if you had parts left over, you, were, you made it better, right? 
Um, <laughs> so uh, I started looking into schools for that. Um, and I actually originally planned on going to Kettering University um, out in Flint. And I really liked their program. I liked the fact that they included um, internships are actually part of your curriculum there. So they help you find an internship for um, part of your schedule. Uh, but I really, really hated the campus. Just really hated it. And I actually ended up going to Lawrence Tech on a tour in high school with one of my classes. And same thing, just fell in love with the campus. I liked all the professors. Um, and then kind of to seal the deal, their professors are actually the advisors there also, which if you can work it out at whatever school you choose, that that's the situation that you're in, where you can have the professors who are teaching your classes also be your advisor, that's, it's huge. It really is, because then you're, you're talking to people who actually know what's going on in these classrooms and can say, don't take these two classes together, you'll drown that semester. Um, so I definitely would advocate for that. Um, I don't know of a lot of schools that are doing that, but it's, it's a really cool thing. Um, another thing that Lawrence Tech did was provide us with a laptop that had all the software on it that we needed, which anyone who knows anything about engineering, we did a lot of really expensive software. Um, so that was nice and really huge, and I didn't have to go to a computer lab every time I needed to do um, a homework assignment. I just had a laptop with everything that I needed. Um, so that's kind of how I landed at Lawrence Tech. Um, <clears throat> and I really made a point to get to know a lot of my professors while I was there some of which I still am in contact with and still collaborate on projects with um, and just email out of the blue on occasion. Um, so you gave to, the to one of the buildings there, didn't you? Yeah, I actually just gave that back when I, uh, I, I so I, up until a few days ago, worked at uh, Beaumont as a research engineer. Um, I resigned my position a few weeks ago and uh, am pursuing some consulting and things like that out of my home office so I can be home a little more. Having a husband who's a pilot makes it a little more complicated to schedule things together, so um, making a little bit of change schedule-wise there. Um, so when I left that position, I turned in my key to uh, Lawrence Tech because um, I wasn't going to be in the area anymore. But yeah, I did up until a few days ago have a key to... I, I want to interject too, Megan uh, was talking about relationships where the professor is actually an advisor. Um, it never ever hurts to nuzzle up to a professor and by that I mean establish a relationship that's a good working relationship with a professor that you really like because folks, they have connections, okay? And that's really important. If you find a teacher or a professor that you really like, they can help you. They can get you places. Those relationships are a beautiful thing and can be very helpful. Including professors that you don't like. Yeah. My, my least favorite professor through my whole career is actually the one who started me on my um, path to my internship at Beaumont, which then led to my full-time job. So I didn't really like the guy, um, but I was a good student, and so he told me about the lab director, um, and I sent him an email, and I volunteered there for about a year. And then I interned there until I finished my undergraduate degree. Um, and I actually planned on um, stopping working there and going to U of M to get my master's. And my boss offered me a full-time job. So I stayed and did my uh, master's at Wayne State after hours. Wow. OK. And so um, master's for you, did, was, that a, was that a want to step or a have to step? Or how do you perceive that? Um, a little bit of both. Um, so I, I wanted to do my master's um, partially because you make a lot more money in engineering with a master's and you're a lot more marketable, um, but also because that allowed me to um, move up to the next level of engineer in our lab, um, which allows you to basically run your own section of the lab. So once I got my master's, um, I was overseeing our entire tissue engineering and biomaterials section of the lab. Um, so my position, um, once I started, once I, once I got that promotion, my position involved um, designing novel biomaterials for use in orthopedic projects. So um, designing scaffolds that would help grow bone or designing um, scaffolds that would support a tendon while it healed. 
um, things like that, and then also implementing chemical factors um, called chemokines, which are basically just um, proteins that signal to your cells to do things. Um, so we would add in these chemokines that would tell cells, I want you to come here. Um, so you would be able to what we call home stem cells to the location that you're trying to heal. So you create this scaffold of this new material and it releases these chemical factors that tell stem cells to flood to the area and then they um, start laying down what we call extracellular matrix, um, which is basically the, the tissue that forms whatever you're trying to make, whether it be bone or tendon or whatever, um, all of that tissue is laid down by cells. So that was kind of, in a nutshell, yeah. what did I did. Did you start, um, I, I don't remember at what point in your career at Beaumont, you were uh, basically troubleshooting prosthetics <coughs> that didn't work. Yeah, so um, up until I was about halfway through my master's, that's what I did. So um, that's where my volunteer position started. Um, and that's where my lower level engineering position was as well. Um, so they have a gigantic implant retrieval and analysis program there. And essentially what that is, is um, any orthopedic device from pins to arthroplasty to spine hardware, excuse me, literally everything, um, anything that fails and has to be replaced, whether it just was at the end of its life cycle or something catastrophic happened, um, anything that gets removed at any of the Beaumont hospitals comes to the lab that I worked in. Um, and so we would do failure analysis on those. We handled all the FDA reporting for um, failures that were catastrophic, you know, implants that fractured when they weren't supposed to, things like that. What do you see next? Uh, so right now I'm working on setting up some consulting relationships with medical device companies. Um, I'm hoping to um, not only sort of advise on the, the biomaterials aspect of things, but um, you know, a big part of consulting in sort of the area of engineering that I've involved myself in um, has to do a lot with uh, clinical documentation and government documentation. Um, so a lot of that will probably be um, serving as sort of an expert on preparing documents for the FDA um, and things like that, and then also consulting on implant designs and things like that based on um, my background. It's so. an uh, interesting point that you just brought up. You know, the, our government, uh, and the military specifically, employ 16% of the engineers that are employed at full-time positions in the United States. 16% are through the government. So those connections can be very, very important as well. There are some really awesome biomedical engineering jobs through the government if you're willing to relocate. Yeah, and uh, so, hey, thanks. I didn't pay you for these segues. This is awesome. <laughs> but I do want to say, yes. I have a quick question. In here it says, well, you, you spoke about uh, consulting. So it, it sort of uh, speaks about a, a move from being, you know, employed as an employee versus, you know, something uh, self-employed or entrepreneurial. Right. Could you speak about that? And, I mean, I would view that to any panelist. Employee, employee versus maybe doing something more freelance. Yeah, so um, one of the nice things about engineering is you usually can get a job with really awesome benefits. Um, so in most cases, people tend to stay in those actual employment jobs. Um, my husband now has really awesome benefits and I don't need mine anymore. Um, so that allowed me to kind of take this, this uh, different path. Um, but, you know, it, it all really comes down to networking. You know, when I started planning this move, um, I knew that I needed to start reaching out to people that I knew. And I've worked with dozens and dozens of device reps and higher up um, managers in medical device companies, especially in orthopedics. Um, I volunteered in some outreach programs that gave me some networking for people who worked at companies like Stryker and Zimmer, which are really big orthopedic implant companies. Um, and so I've just been kind of reaching out to those people and saying, hey, you know, if you have anything that you need a consultant for, keep me in mind. Um, I've passed my resume to people and it tends to very quickly make it to the top of the stack. So really it's, in engineering, it's all about who you know. Um, and so the, I think the single best piece of advice that I can give to anyone 
is talk to people and make an impression. And it's, it's not even about making an impression about your education or anything like that. You just want to make an impression that you're a good person and you're a hard worker because it goes a really, really long way in this field. Do you feel there's risk involved in there? I mean, there is, definitely, because, you know, as a consultant, you get paid for the work that you seek out, right? So you don't necessarily have a steady flow of income. So you, you kind of have to be in a position where that's okay um, to pursue something like that. But, um, you know, once you are, you, you can make a lot of money consulting as well. Did you, you know, know that about yourself earlier on, or is that something? Is that, that I was going to go into consulting? Just take that, that, take that route. I mean, that's no, it, it, uh, it wasn't, wasn't in the plan. Um, it just kind of, uh, as my husband's career has changed, it, it became difficult for us to schedule anything as a family because I have weekends and nights off and he almost never has weekends and nights off. Um, so it just uh, came to a point where, you know, he's, he's in a job now where he's got really good benefits and we didn't need mine anymore. Obviously working for a hospital, I had pretty good insurance. Um, and so I was able to kind of make this change um, there's other jobs that you can pursue, pursue too that are, are sort of more work from home positions, um, medical writing and editing, things like that. Um, but yeah, you know, as a consultant, there's a, there's a certain risk there for sure. And it's, it's all about building your clientele. Did anyone encourage you throughout your, uh, your formation? And education uh, ever touched on that? Junk. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I, when I first started planning on making a change, I actually um, reached out to Shunk about um, a letter of recommendation and, and things like that. And she kind of <laughs> steered me um, towards consulting after talking to her about you know, what I wanted and that I wanted a more flexible schedule and, and that sort of thing. So it, it was just, I just happened to have a conversation uh, with some people who wanted to set up, is it called a cleaning room? Yep. Okay. A cleaner room, I thought, Megan's got that in her back pocket. She can do that. So I called Megan, and I'm like, okay, I think this might be you. And she was like, funny you should mention that. And, and that's one of the uh, businesses that she's having conversations with right now about things that are coming up. So one of the things that she's considering is more project-based, you know? So maybe you decide to take uh, take on a project here or there, or maybe it's out of Chicago or Philadelphia, but she could work from home and do that, you know? Um, whatever, and maybe she has to run there for one weekend while Andrew gets to stay home and be dad. And that's, you know, that's a cool opportunity that she has. But you have to build those relationships. That's what makes that go, right? That's what makes the consulting ability um, happen because you have those relationships. People know of your work. They know of the quality of, of your uh, of the performance that you you know that you've done maybe with them or maybe uh, that they brought work to you or to your facility before. And Megan spent some time establishing those, and, and you know she presents as professional as she is. You know that's it. It's like you know you're going to get quality work. Okay. This is John. John, you probably came from the biggest high school that we have on the panel here, yes? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And uh, so, John, when you were in high school, what were you thinking? What did you want to do? Uh, the only thing I knew is I wanted to be rich, and I wanted to go to Michigan. <laughs> I actually had wanted to go to Michigan since, like, I was five, because I was a huge Michigan football fan. And uh, it was weird. I... I know I'm an engineer now, but I actually wanted to be a doctor because the mentor I looked up to was a doctor, and she uh, did chemical in engineering as an undergrad, and I thought that I would take that path myself. So prior to going into industrial engineering, I was actually a chemical engineer until I learned I kind of hated it, and I, I ended up taking a semester off to sort of like soul search or figure out what it, what it is I'm really passionate about. And I actually contemplated switching to econ, um, but it was my uh, advisor in college that talked me out of it because at Michigan, the engineering program was like top 10 in the country, and industrial engineering has a lot of overlap with business, and that was number two in the country. So it was really hard for me to, to justify switching to the LSNA school out of the College of Engineering. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so, um, and that's one of the babies, uh, industrial operational engineering, that's one of the babies, Michigan's babies, you know? 
I mean, that's something that is on their brag list for programs in engineering. Yeah, it's a really unique program. And uh, they just came out with a, a business minor. So what you can do is you can major in industrial engineering and then minor through the Ross School of Business. Which, that's very cool. And you said that there is a significant crossover in that field, yes? Oh, yeah. A ton of, a ton of my, uh, the other grads in the, in the IOE program, they ended up becoming consultants. A lot of them. I would say maybe even half. Really? Yeah, business consultants. When you, okay, so when you were in high school and you said you wanted to go to Michigan and you wanted to make money, that yeah. was it. And so uh, you decided, when you went into Michigan, did you go in LSNA or how did you No, no, no. I, I, was, I uh, applied directly to the College of Engineering because my, uh, AC, my math ACT score was my highest and I figured I'd leverage that to try and get into the uh, engineering school. Plus I had all the honors and APs that were in math and science, so it just kind of made writing my application a lot easier, which I was really lazy about. I only applied to Michigan and Michigan State, um, and I don't know, I, I guess I kind of got lucky, but. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you, you know that you had, um, you had the goods. You had what they needed. You had what you knew was going to work for you. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was a little arrogant in high school. Well. <laughs> I, exp I expected to get in, I guess. Okay, um, and so when you, when you started in that program, did you think, what am I doing? I mean, you, you said a you little bit, because yeah, because I mean, IOE is it's it's really broad and they touch on so many things. I mean, there's statistics, there's operations research, um, consulting, st st statistical process control, um, simulation, data mining. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly, you know, what what you love. Um, but what actually helped for me is I joined the Alternative Investments Club, which was through Ross, and I was able to kind of learn that. I liked equity research, I liked, uh, you know, following investments and companies like that. Um, and that's kind of what I've discovered is my passion and what I hope to segue into, you know, next steps after this entry level engineering job that I'm working at now. So what does the day look like for you? Like, what do you do? So I'm an application engineer at Daifuku and we're a materials handling company and I'm specifically in the airport division. And so we handle all the baggage handling. So there's standard conveyor, there's trays, and it's a lot of simulation and um, getting layouts from airport authorities and consultants and speaking with subcontractors and taking that, putting it into AutoCAD, simulating it, coming up with value engineering ideas to make it more efficient, make it cheaper, so we can be more competitive when we're bidding these projects. Because what our work is, it's contractual. It's, there's, there's always something that we're bidding. It's in a way, it kind of is like construction. So is that what you do? Do you put together those bids, or how, what do you? Yeah, do? I work on the technical proposals. Okay. So I'll do any any of those things. I'll put, I'll draw an AutoCAD. I'll simulate it. I'll come up with the schedule, uh, the installation schedule, which re really drives price and more times than not determines whether or not we win it. And have you ever had to follow through with one of those? Like, let's say you develop this whole schedule for a project. And have you been able to watch that project through fruition? Um, not, not yet, because for us, they take, on average, like three years. Okay. And I've only been there a year and a half. Um, but I mean, working there, it's been cool. I've been able to travel to different airports. I've been to Japan twice. I've been to uh, New York, uh, Orlando. So I mean, it's cool. Yeah. And who do you meet with when you go there? Airport authorities, uh, consultants a lot. For the most part, the consultants are in the bigger cities like Chicago and New York. Do you go, when you go, is it a team or is it just you or how does that work? Yeah, it's usually a team, like two or three of us. And do they say, hey, you're really young, you can do this? No, it's kind of assumed that you're sort of like on the team to, to listen more than speak because a lot of the guys in, in our business have been there for 10, 20 years. And so they, they know way more and you're just kind of learning. All right, and so where do you say, what, what do you think is on the horizon for you? Well, I have a cushy job, but what I really enjoy is business. And uh, in my free time, I actually read books on finance. And what I'm hoping to do is kind of transition into that and use uh, relationships I've built in college and uh, the investments club and, and things like that, things I read in my free time, uh, to try and transition into finance. We want to do with finance.
Uh, I really like equity research. Uh, things I look at are as, as investment analysts, um, probably working at uh, private equity or hedge fund or something like that. Smaller firms. Do engineering firms need somebody like that or no? What do you mean? Well, the, the job that you're going for, or yeah. the one that you really think is interesting, is there a place for that in engineering? Or The investments in engineering? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say so. I don't know how much I've been exposed to it. But one thing I will say is that uh, being a quant, like being quantitative is so important. It, it, it doesn't matter. What does that mean? Being a qu I mean, <laughs> quant quantitative math skills. It's yeah. just, I mean, that's so important. Probably the things that uh, companies value more than anything is, are you quantitative and can you communicate? And I would say just work on that, really. Yeah? Okay, and um, did any of the connections that you made at Michigan help you get the job that you did, or? Yeah, uh, so I got this job through the career fair, which I would recommend you go to every year um, when you're in school. Um, definitely networking, uh, building relationships with professors and GSIs and TAs, that's the most important thing for sure. And like using your LinkedIn, I wish I made mine sooner because that's been so helpful. Did you hear that? Everybody who doesn't have all your kids that don't have a LinkedIn, take a look at that, okay? Because your first year in college, put that thing together and start building. Yeah, every time you meet somebody, just add that. For those of you who don't have an email address, set up a professional email address. Yeah, soccerhottie22, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to do that. As close to your full name as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what, do you, what, what do you think is important for these kids to know being high school, um, maybe freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? What's important right now? Uh, I mean, get good or get good grades. Like, expect A's out of yourself, or at least aim for it. Uh, definitely volunteer, and that's you know, that's something that you should do. Not just in high school, so you can put it on your application to look good, but you really need to kind of build yourself as a giver and not a taker, because people can read that almost immediately, and it just kind of it, it puts you in the right mindset. And if you can just keep volunteering throughout your life. I think that's a great piece of advice. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and that's what these guys are doing right now is giving up their time, which I am so appreciative of. Um, John, what, did you do anything else when you were at Michigan? Uh, I was on the sailing team. Okay. And um, that's cool. Did you, uh, so in, in Ann Arbor, where are we sailing? Uh, mostly Inland Lakes. I guess you go to the, like Lake Michigan, if you go to Evanston or Northwestern, Chicago, things like that. There was big boat races on the East Coast, but I never really did that because I actually didn't start sailing until I went to Michigan. But, that's cool. Yeah. But that's, you know, you bring up another interesting point, you know. What's available to you now? What kind of things are you involved in now? The clubs and organizations, and I can't wait for time to talk about that. The clubs and organizations on campus, the opportunities are phenomenal. Okay? So make sure that you... Um, uh, see what's there because here's uh, the important thing that you are a well-rounded person that you've had the opportunity to experience that you've networked with a lot of people who are maybe different than you that um, you've reached out like Gunnar said he was in athletics and he went on a baseball scholarship no 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 I'm sorry he went on an academic scholarship and played baseball um, but he got to meet a lot of different people as a result of that okay people that weren't necessarily as physics-y or math -y as he was, you know, that were in a, uh, uh, communications and you like that, yeah, those are brand new old words I just made up, and uh, um, some different careers, different career paths, like, for example, sports management and communications and all those other degrees that might have been surrounding a baseball team, but, you know, here's the math guy, you know, doing his thing. That's awesome. Yeah, cl club sports is huge. Well, uh, one thing I would also recommend is that when you go to college, you should almost immediately seek out a professional organization or a club or something, because Michigan was huge, and it was really intimidating to me. And I regret not joining a club that first year. And so now we have last down here, this is Tom Lewis, and he just popped in from a meeting in California, in the office over here. Um, he's taking care of business. And you see, he's the senior on the panel here. He's got some cool experience and some cool uh, ideas. 
And I do want to say that, Tom, let's start from uh, Levi's in high school. So when you were in high school, he, he did a night with the neuron for me, you know, in a psych class, and he did some, a puppet show in the front of the classroom for, I don't even remember what it was, the Romeo and Juliet maybe, you know, turn the table over. But um, so I, I've known Tom since, 1999, as a matter of fact. Well, that's weird. And uh, you graduated from Reed City in 2003. And Tom, when you were in high school, what did you think you were going to do? Um, well, first, it's interesting to be the old fart. You know, I'm always the young guy. <laughs> so <laughs> through my whole career, I've always been young. So it's, it's interesting and different perspective. Um, so <laughs> how to explain my high school experience? Uh, I'd say the most important takeaway I had from high school was get out of your comfort zone. Uh, and do something exciting and different. So I did puppet shows. I think we were supposed to do a report and people wrote written reports. And I just asked if I could do a puppet show instead. And I did, and it was great. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, also, I did the morning announcements. So we had uh, video announcements. And I, that was the first year that we decided to do that at Marine City. And they needed some guinea pigs for it. And I was like, sure, whatever, I can do morning announcements. You know, <laughs> And you just kind of, you run with it. You learn along the way, you know, it was, a lot prettier at the end than it was in the beginning. We got a lot more innovative. We did mobile announcements walking around the halls. And I don't know, it was just, uh, it was really interesting. I went into drama, so I was always in sports. Um, uh, you know, I did football, uh, basketball, and track. Uh, and then I was switching the winter sport around because I was never really good at any of them. So I did basketball and then wrestling and swimming uh, just to keep myself busy. Um, but I, I don't know, I, I just decided to do some, some other things on top of that. Drama uh, was really fun. I didn't expect that to be fun, uh, but it was. Um, I ran for class president, so I was never involved in student government, and then I just decided the last year to run for it. I didn't know it was a lifetime commitment at the time, uh, so if any of you are thinking about it, keep that in mind. Um, but I <laughs> ran for class president and got that. Uh, I was NHS president, um, so I just kind of started picking things up and, and learning along the way. And I think it was, you know, that was part of really what shaped, um, you know, my future and my career as well. Uh, just being willing to try different things and learn and being willing to, uh, to let yourself be vulnerable, you know, to not act like an expert. You know, I didn't come to the morning announcements acting like I was a seasoned uh, newscaster or anything. You know, you just kind of admit that you're, a, a, you know, you're a learner, that you're, a novice and uh, get input from people, take that seriously, you know, and keep uh, learning along the way. Um, and I've had a lot of experiences like that in my career too. One being in manufacturing engineering. I, I didn't think I'd like manufacturing engineering. It just seemed like just something that wasn't innovative where I wouldn't use my, uh, my engineering background. But it actually ended up being the area where I could use engineering the most. You know, you really have uh, fast moving issues that you have to solve quickly. And uh, a lot of times in designs you have in, de in design engineering, you have, you know, year or two year long projects where you don't really see the fruit of your labor until much later. Uh, and a lot of times you're not really using engineering principles, you know, you're testing and kind of um, improvising along the way. So I felt like, uh, yeah, I'm going off on a tangent here, I think. But uh, in any case, it's, it's good to, uh, to keep an open mind, try new things, because you may find that you are interested in something that you had never thought you would be. Yeah. So interesting, uh, I, I've stayed in contact with Tom uh, for the, this, the course of his career is uh, academics as well. And a couple things that happened along the way I think were really interesting. First of all, when he first got to U of M Dearborn, uh, I asked him if he felt behind at all. And this is something that you probably want to hear. And you said you felt behind in uh, software. You didn't, you didn't know the applications that people were using. And some kids from bigger high schools like Northville would have, you know, opportunity for, to have that software available and use it. How many of you have engineering software in high school that you're using right now? Good for you. Yay. That's awesome. Um, if you don't, are there ways that you can think about to get that? Let me tell you, one of the courses of action that I did I, when my daughter was interested in architecture, she really thought that's what she wanted to do. And I knew we didn't have access to it. And because of my conversation with Tom, I was kind of worried. I thought, well, if she's going to U of M, she's going to be behind. So the summer before she started school there, actually it was a dual enrolled class. And she took uh, like a, a, an architectural engineering 101 or whatever. I mean, just some kind of really basic class, just so that she had an introduction to the software. Okay. Of course, I bought her stuff. You know, I 
I would go, oh, here, here's a nice program for architecture. You know, thanks, Mom. No, 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 you don't know what you're doing. But to have that same experience, you know, with school, like in an academic setting, where she can have that conversation with a professor who says, yes, this is what's used in the industry. This is what is this is what we use. Because of that conversation with Tom, I knew that that's what I had to take. So that's one of the reasons that we have this type of activity, so that you can get a little heads up on the things that are coming up, you know? So that you feel on top of the game when you head off for school. You know what to look for. So Tom, can you talk about you know playing catch up at U of M when you got there? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I think that uh, a lot of people, when they get into college, they're faced with some new challenges, and it can be really defeating. You know, you may think that uh, you're really smart, you know, you did really well in high school, and then all of a sudden you go into college and there's a class that really, you know, knocks, knocks you off your feet. Um, but it's really important to have a mindset going into college that there are going to be new things you have to learn. You're not going to be in this situation where you're validating yourself as the top dog. You know, there are a lot of times uh, in high school, I was competing for grades against Jamie Antonevich. You know, we always raced to the board to see who got first, you know, and that was, uh, was kind of, it was exciting, you know, and I it was probably one of the reasons I did well in math was com competing with Jamie. Um, also an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, once you get into college, that changes. You know, the, the talent of the people who are there is, uh, is much higher. Uh, the topics are much more difficult. Um, and you can't let yourself get defeated. You know, it's, it's not about that. It's not about validating yourself as a, a top performer anymore. It's about learning. And as soon as you change your mindset to having a, a zest for learning, uh, a passion for learning, as, long, as soon as you get excited about seeing the things you don't know, uh, then you, you start really growing. You know, you should be excited to see this is something I don't know, this is new for me, this is what college is all about, uh, and really dive into it head first uh, and put some effort into it. And so, you know, let's take, for example, you have to take all those engineering classes, and then one time, I don't remember if I was talking to you on the phone or email or text or whatever the case may be, I'm teaching myself German. Was it German that came first or Japanese? Uh, I started with German and then uh, Japanese. Yeah, it, you know, he's teaching himself. You know, it wasn't like this was a class or something that he, you know, needed to do. But what was the situation that you wanted to learn German? Well, I was interning. Uh, at a German company. Actually, I still work for Bosch. started with Bosch in 2005 uh, as an intern. Uh, and it was kind of always a uh, given that I'd go to Germany. So I, I thought, oh, I should learn German. Um, but then along the way, I, I joined a management trainee program and had the opportunity to go to Japan. So I kind of switched that around and started learning uh, Japanese. Uh, having a little uh, background in German certainly helps. And it's, uh, it's fun when I go to Germany on business trips uh, to order beer and whatever in German. You know, it's, <laughs> that's about the extent of my German. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm I'm glad that I that I switched as well and saw that I actually learning German in a German company and being a non-German it was not as useful at all as learning Japanese as an American uh, and being fluent in English and Japanese because there aren't so many Japanese people who speak English very well, especially on the top level. Um, so that was a great judgment call uh, to switch at that time. I'm fluent in Japanese now and. I uh, use it in business uh, all the time. Actually, that's how I got my current role, uh, being in charge of Japanese OEMs. Um, yeah. how, so how long did you live in Japan? So I, it was a plan for six months. Uh, it turned into six years. So I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't go there planning to move for six years. Uh, so don't let that scare you. It's not like you're going to have uh, anyone say, hey, you want to move to Japan for six years. Uh, it was something I wanted to do to extend and to keep going. Uh, it was all natural as well, so I, I, I went there for six months and realized that it takes longer than six months to learn Japanese. Um, I heard there was a guy who went to Harvard who did that, so I was, uh, actually I was energized, I thought I could. I was like, man, if he did it, I can do this. <laughs> um, but I didn't do it as a full-time job as he did, I guess, so <laughs> studying before and after work, um, you know, I, I got pretty good, but it, it was no, I was nowhere near uh, fluent yet, so I wanted to stay to learn Japanese. Uh, and then once I learned Japanese to a level that I was comfortable in business, I didn't want to just go home because then I waste it. You know, when I, you can't <laughs> use it except to watch anime if you come back to the U.S. Um, <laughs> so I uh, took a sales position. Uh, so that's how it took me two and a half years to become fluent uh, in Japanese. And um, I, taking that sales position, I, I was selling navigation systems uh, for Bosch. And then I sold something. So I sold a global project and. 
Uh, that was great, and I felt like going home, but then the customer wanted me to stay, Bosch wanted me to stay, it was a new customer, we didn't have a team, so they wanted me to lead the team to develop the product, and I wanted to get back into engineering anyway. Sales was just my excuse to use Japanese. Um, so I switched back into engineering to develop that product. Uh, so that's just another two years that was tacked on, and it was all really logical, a lot of fun. I loved Japan, it was, it was great. Yeah, so engineering gives you the, experience, or the opportunity to move, uh, especially internationally, and I definitely recommend it. I spent six months in India as well. Um, really liked India. I liked Bangalore a lot. Um, but it really opens your eyes to how business is done in other countries. lets you see how competitive other countries are uh, in engineering as well, uh, which can definitely open your eyes to some things. Um, but I recommend it if you have chances to go abroad. Yeah. In engineering, folks, it does provide you the opportunity to move, to travel, yes? Um, and most of you work for global companies. Not, but you could. I think you track it, though, for sure. Off you go. And for free. Now that your husband can. Um, <laughs> so that's a cool thing. Um, but I do want to say that, uh, Tom, yeah, you're the old guy on the panel here. And so you have the opportunity to uh, go through the process to learn where you want to be. Is this, do you think right now this is where you want to be and this is what you want to do? Um. For now, <laughs> but uh, no, not long term. I, uh, I think it's been great that I've had a background, you know, swapping in between sales and engineering, and now I'm in charge of quality as well. Uh, so eventually, you know, the next role, the role after that, uh, I'd like to be a regional president or something that's in charge of all of these different areas. In this day, yep. I mean, you did just build up, so <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a cool thing that you finally, I, I, I was excited when I saw you were considering being here. I thought, well, that's a cool thing, finally, you know, because he has been all over, and now for to see him come back, that makes me happy. We have Levi's in the house, that's good. Right. It's good to be home. <laughs> and a dad, too. Yep. Happy dad. Yeah. Both of you have two young parents on this panel. Uh, and so, one of the things that is really nice about engineering and Megan knows this because she looked into teaching. She thought, well, I don't know if I really want to work at Beaumont anymore. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'll teach. Maybe I'll be an adjunct professor somewhere. And what do I need to do to do that? You know, she knew. And so she started to look into that and she said, it's more cost efficient for me to stay home <laughs> and to do some other things from home. So engineering does provide a decent lifestyle. Would you all agree? Yes.